Chapter 3. The Secret of Work Helping others physically by removing their physical needs is indeed great, but the help is great according as the need is greater, and according as the help is far-reaching. If a man wants can be removed for an hour, it is helping him indeed. If his wants can be removed for a year, it will be more help to him. But if his wants can be removed forever, it is surely the greatest help that can be given him. Spiritual knowledge is the only thing that can destroy our miseries forever. Any other knowledge satisfies wants only for a time. It is only with the knowledge of the spirit that the faculty of want is annihilated forever, so helping man spiritually is the highest help that can be given to him. He who gives man spiritual knowledge is the greatest benefactor of mankind, and as such we always find that those were the most powerful of men who helped man in his spiritual needs, because spirituality is the true basis of all our activities in life. A spiritually strong and sound man will be strong in every other respect, if he so wishes. Until there is spiritual strength in man, even physical needs cannot be well satisfied. Next to spiritual comes intellectual help. The gift of knowledge is a far higher gift than that of food and clothes. It is even higher than giving life to man, because the real life of man consists of knowledge. Ignorance is death, knowledge is life. Life is of very little value, if it is a life in the dark, groping through ignorance and misery. Next in order comes, of course, helping a man physically. Therefore, in considering the question of helping others, we must always strive not to commit the mistake of thinking that physical help is the only help that can be given. It is not only the last but the least, because it cannot bring about permanent satisfaction. The misery that I feel when I am hungry is satisfied by eating, but hunger returns. My misery can cease only when I am satisfied beyond all want. Then hunger will not make me miserable. No distress, no sorrow will be able to move me. So that help which tends to make us strong spiritually is the highest. Next to it comes intellectual help, and after that physical help. The miseries of the world cannot be cured by physical help only. Until man's nature changes, these physical needs will always arise, and misery will always be felt. And no amount of physical help will cure them completely. The only solution to this problem is to make mankind pure. Ignorance is the mother of all the evil and all the misery we see. Let men have light, let them be pure and spiritually strong and educated, then alone will misery cease in the world, not before. We may convey every house in the country into a charity asylum, we may fill the land with hospitals, but the misery of man will still continue to exist until man's character changes. We read in the Bhagavad Gita again and again that we must all work incessantly. All work is by nature composed of good and evil. We cannot do any work which will not do some good somewhere. There cannot be any work which will not cause some harm somewhere. Every work must necessarily be a mixture of good and evil, yet we are commanded to work incessantly. Good and evil will both have their results, will produce their karma. Good action will entail upon us good effect, bad action, bad. But good and bad are both bondages of the soul. The solution reached in the Gita in regard to this bondage-producing nature of work is that, if we do not attach ourselves to the work we do, it will not have any binding effect on our soul. We shall try to understand what is meant by this non-attachment to do work. This is the one central idea in the Gita, work incessantly, but be not attached to it. Samskara can be translated very nearly by inherent tendency. Using the simile of a lake for the mind, every ripple, every wave that rises in the mind, when it subsides, does not die out entirely, but leaves a mark in a future possibility of that wave coming out again. This mark, with the possibility of the wave reappearing, is what is called samskara. Every work that we do, every movement of the body, every thought that we think, leaves such an impression on the mind stuff. And even when such impressions are not obvious on the surface, they are sufficiently strong to work beneath the surface subconsciously. What we are every moment is determined by the sum total of these impressions on the mind. What I am just at this moment is the effect of the sum total of all the impressions on my past life. This is really what is meant by character. Each man's character is determined by the sum total of these impressions. If good impressions prevail, the character becomes good. If bad, it becomes bad. If a man continuously hears bad words, thinks bad thoughts, does bad actions, his mind will be full of bad impressions, and they will influence his thought and work without his being conscious of the fact. In fact, these bad impressions are always working, and their results must be evil, and that man will be a bad man, he cannot help it. 
The sum total of these impressions in him will create the strong motive power for doing good and bad actions. He will be like a machine in the hands of his impression, and they will force him to do evil. Similarly, if a man thinks good thoughts and does good works, the sum total of those impressions will be good, and they, in a similar manner, will force him to do good even in spite of himself. When a man has done so much good work and thought so many good thoughts, then there is an irresistible tendency in him to do good in spite of himself. And even if he wishes to do evil, his mind, as a sum total of his tendencies, will not allow him to do so. The tendencies will turn him back. He is completely under the influence of the good tendencies when such is the case, a good man's character is said to be established. As a tortoise tucks its feet and head inside the shell, and you may kill it and break it into pieces, and yet it will not come out. Even so the character of that man who has control over his motives and organs is unchangeably established. He controls his own inner forces and nothing can draw them out against his will. By this continuous reflex of good thoughts, good impressions moving over the surface of the mind, the tendency for doing good becomes strong, and as a result we feel able to control the indriyas, the sense organs or the nerve centers. Thus alone will character be established, then alone a man gets to peace. Such a man is safe forever, he cannot do any evil. You may place him in a company, there will be no danger for him. There is still higher state than having his good tendency, and that is a desire for liberation. You must remember that freedom of the soul is the goal of all yogas, and each one equally leads to the same result. By work alone, men may get to where Buddha got largely by meditation or Christ by prayer. Buddha was a working Janai, Christ was a Bhakta, but the same goal was reached by both of them. The difficulty is here. Liberation means entire freedom, freedom from the bondage of good as well as from the bondage of evil. A golden chain is as much a chain as an iron one. There is a thorn in my finger, and I use another to take one out first, and when I have taken it out, I throw both of them aside. I have no necessity for keeping a second thorn, because both are thorns after all. So the bad tendencies are to be counteracted by the good ones, and the bad impressions of the mind should be removed by the fresh waves of good ones, until all that is evil almost disappears, or is subdued, and held in control and corner of the mind. But after that the good tendencies have also to be conquered. Thus the attached becomes the unattached. Work, but let not the action or the thought produce a deep impression of the mind. Let the ripples come and go. Let huge actions proceed from the muscles in the brain, but let them not make any deep impressions on the soul. So how can this be done? We see that the impressions of any action to which we attach ourselves remain. I may meet hundreds of persons during the day, and among them meet also one whom I love, and when I retire at night I may try to think of all the faces I saw, but only that face comes before the mind. The face which I met peeped perhaps only for one minute, and which I loved, and all the others have vanished. My attachment to this particular person caused a deeper impression on my mind than all the other faces. Physiologically, the impressions have all been the same. Every one of the faces that I saw pictured itself on the retina, and the brain took the pictures in. And yet there was no similarity of effect upon the mind. Most of the faces, perhaps, were entirely new faces, about which I had never thought about before, but that one face, of which I got only a glimpse, found association inside. Perhaps I had pictured him in my mind for years, knew hundreds of things about him, and this one new vision of him awakened hundreds of sleeping memories in my mind, and this one impression, having been repeated perhaps a hundred times more than those of the different faces together, will produce a great effect on the mind. Therefore, be unattached. Let things work. Let brain centers work. Work incessantly. But let not a ripple conquer the mind. Work as if you were a stranger in this land, a sojourner. Work incessantly, but do not bind yourself. Bondage is terrible. This world is not our habitation. It is only one of the many stages through which we are passing. Remember the great saying of the Shankya, The whole of nature is for the soul, not the soul for nature. The very reason of nature's existence is for the education of the soul. It has no other meaning. It is there because the soul must have knowledge, and through knowledge free itself. If we remember this also, we will always never be attached to nature. We shall know that nature is a book in which we are to read, and that when we have gained the required knowledge, the book is of no more value to us. Instead of that, however, we are identifying ourselves with nature, 
We are thinking that the soul is for nature and that the spirit is for the flesh. And as the common saying has it, we think that man lives to eat and not eats to live. We are continually making this mistake. We are regarding nature as ourselves and are becoming attached to it. And as soon as this attachment comes, there is a deep impression on the soul which binds us down and makes us work not from freedom, but like slaves. The whole gist of this teaching is that you should work like a master and not as a slave. Work incessantly, but do not do slaves' work. Do you not see how everyone works? Nobody can be altogether at rest. Ninety-nine percent of mankind works like slaves, and the result is misery. It is all selfish work. Work through freedom. Work through love. The word love is very difficult to understand. Love never comes until there is freedom. There is no true love possible in the slave. If you buy a slave and tie him down in chains and make him work for you, he will work like a drudge, but there will be no love in him. So when we ourselves work for the things of the world of slaves, there can be no love in us, and our work is not true work. This is true work done for relatives and friends, and this is true of work done for our own selves. Selfish work is slaves' work, and here is a test. Every act of love brings happiness. There is no act of love which does not bring peace and blessedness as its reaction. Real existence, real knowledge, and real love are eternally connected with one another, the three in one. Where one of them is, the other is almost must be. They are the three aspects of the one without a second. The existence, knowledge, bliss. When that existence becomes relative, we see it as the world. That knowledge becomes in its turn modified in the knowledge of the things of the world, and that bliss forms the foundation of all true love known to the heart of man. Therefore, true love can never react so as to cause pain either to the lover or to the beloved. Suppose a man loves a woman. He wishes to have her all to himself and feels extremely jealous about her every movement. He wants her to sit near him, to stand near him, to eat and move at his bidding. He is a slave to her and wishes to have her as his slave. That is not love. It is a kind of morbid affection of the slave, insinuating itself as love. It cannot be love because it is painful. If she does not want what he wants, it brings him pain. With love there is no painful reaction. Love only brings a reaction of bliss. If it does not, it is not love. It is mistaking something else for love. When you have succeeded in loving your husband, your wife, your children, the whole world, the universe, in such a manner that there is no reaction of pain or jealousy, no selfish feeling, then you are in a fit state to be unattached. Krishna said, Look at me, Arjuna. If I stop from work for one moment, the whole universe will die. I have nothing to gain from work. I am the Lord. But why do I work? Because I love the world. God is unattached because he loves, that real loves makes us unattached. Where there is attachment, the clinging to the things of the world, you must know that it is all physical attraction between sets of particles of matter, something that attracts two bodies near and near all the time. And if they cannot get near enough, produces pain. But where there is real love, it does not rest on physical attachment at all. Such lovers may be thousands of miles away from each other, but their love will all be the same. It does not die and will never produce any painful reaction. To attain this unattachment is almost a life work, but as soon as we have reached this point, we have attained the goal of love and become free. The bondage of nature falls from us, and as we see nature as she is, she forgoes no more chains for us. We stand entirely free and take not the results of work into consideration. Who then cares for what the results may be? Do not ask anything from your children in return for what you have given them. It is your duty to work for them, and there the matter ends. In whatever you do for a particular person, a city, state, assume the same attitude towards it as you have towards your children. Expect nothing in return. If you can invariably take the position of a giver, in which everything given by you is a free offering to the world without any thought of return, then will your work bring no attachment. Attachment comes only where we expect a return. If working like slaves results in selfishness and attachment, working as master of your own mind gives rise to the bliss of non-attachment. We often talk of right and justice, but we find that in the world right and justice are mere baby's talk. There are two things which guide the conduct of men, might and mercy. The exercise of might is invariably the exercise of selfishness. All men and women try to make the most of whatever power or advantage they have. Mercy is heaven itself. To be good, we all have to be merciful. Even justice and right should stand on mercy. 
all thought of obtaining return for the work we do hinders our spiritual progress, nay, in the end it brings misery. There is another way in which this idea of mercy and selfless charity can be put into practice. That is, by looking upon work as worship, in case we believe in a personal God. Here we give up all the fruits of our work unto the Lord, and worshiping Him thus, we have no right to expect anything from mankind for the work we do. The Lord Himself works incessantly and is ever without attachment, just as water cannot wet the lotus leaf, so work cannot bind the unselfish man by giving rise to attachment to results. The selfish and unattached man may live in the very heart of a crowded and sinful city. He will not be touched by sin. This idea of complete self-sacrifice is illustrated in the following story. After the battle of Kurukshetra, the five Pandava brothers performed a great sacrifice and made very large gifts to the poor. All people expressed amazement at the greatness and richness of the sacrifice and said that such a sacrifice the world had never seen before. But after the ceremony there came a little mongoose, half of whose body was golden and the other half brown, and he began to roll on the floor of the sacrificial hall. He said to those around, You are all liars, this is no sacrifice. What, they exclaimed, you say this is no sacrifice. Do you not know how money and jewels were poured out to the poor and every one became rich and happy? This was the most wonderful sacrifice any man ever performed. But the mongoose said, There was once a little village and in it there dwelt the poor Brahmin with his wife, his son, and his son's wife. They were very poor and lived on small gifts made to them for preaching and teaching. There came in that land a three years' famine, and the poor Brahmin suffered more than ever. At last, when the family had starved for days, the father brought home one morning a little barley flour, which he had been fortunate enough to obtain, and he divided it into four parts, one for each member of the family. They prepare it for their meal, and just as they were about to eat, there was a knock at the door. The father opened it, and there stood a guest. Now in India, a guest is a sacred person. He is a god for the time being, and must be treated as such. So the poor Brahmin said, Come in, sir, you are welcome. He set before the guest his own portion of the food, which the guest quickly ate and said, Oh, sir, you have killed me. I have been starving for ten days, and this little bit has but increased my hunger. Then the wife said to her husband, Give him my share, but the husband said, Not so. The wife, however, insisted, saying, Here is a poor man, and it is our duty as a householder to see that he is fed, and it is my duty as a wife to give him my portion, seeing that you have no more to offer him. Then she gave her share to the guest, which he ate, and said he was still burning with hunger. So the son said, Take my portion also. It is the duty of a son to help his father to fulfill his obligation. The guest ate that, but remained still unsatisfied, so the son's wife gave him her portion also. That was sufficient, and the guest departed, blessing them. That night those four people died of starvation. A few granules of that flour had fallen on the floor, and when I rolled my body on them, half of it became golden as you see. Since then I have been traveling all over the world, hoping to find another sacrifice like that, but nowhere have I found one. Nowhere else has the other half of my body been turned into gold. That is why I say this is no sacrifice. This idea of charity is going out of India. Great men are becoming fewer and fewer. When I was first learning English, I read an English storybook in which there was a story about a dutiful boy who had gone out to work and had given some of his money to his old mother, and this was praised in three or four pages. What was that? No Hindu boy can ever understand the moral of that story. Now I understand it when I hear the Western idea, every man for himself. And some men take everything for themselves, and fathers and mothers and wives and children go to the wall. That should never and nowhere be the ideal of the householder. Now, you see what karma yoga means. Even at the point of death, to help anyone without asking questions, be cheated millions of times, and never ask a question, and never think of what you are doing. Never vaunt of your gifts to the poor or expect their gratitude, but rather be grateful to them for giving you the occasion of practicing charity to them. Thus it is plain that to be an ideal householder is a much more difficult task than to be an ideal sannyasin. The true life of work is indeed as hard as, if not harder than, the equally true life of renunciation.